welcome to another day of the DC Today. It is the Wednesday edition. Uh, it was a weird day in markets. I don't want to say it was boring. I don't want to say it was exciting. Uh, kind of somewhere in between, but definitely weird. Let's start with the economics, get to kind of the bigger important stuff that took most of my morning, my early morning, and then the market day itself was what it was. The CPI number came out, <clears throat> and it did come at 4.9% year over year. Analysts have been expecting 5%, and so a tiny bit lower than expected, and um, the lowest level we've seen now since April of 2021. So the uh, lowest uh, year-over-year number in a full two years. And so I just am going to give another caveat. I expect a lot of you know where I'm going, but it's profoundly true and accurate, what I'm about to say, and important. And that is that the shelter component into uh, CPI came in at 8.1% year over year. That represents 34% of the CPI weighting. I believe the owner's equivalent rent was 8.8% of that, and the rents were 8.6% were of that. So it was blending to 8.1, which at a, a 40, excuse me, a 34% weighting means it was adding 2.75% to the 4.9 inflation rate. So without it, if shelter was zero, hypothetically, you would have had a 2.25% inflation rate. And I'm willing to say that the shelter inflation wasn't zero um, because I'm partially willing to say it may have been negative 2%, negative 1%. It, it could have been positive one or positive two as well. There's a lot of complexity and challenge but again, as long as we're still a month or two or whatever it is away from this lag effect catching up of the rents and leases that were effectuated a year ago and, and we're that far disconnected from the current level of rents of which abundant levels of data are available, my point is simply that outside of this clearly idiosyncratic and highly distortive lag effect of the shelter inflation input, you're probably at a two and a half inflation. And if someone wants to argue for three, that's fine, but it ain't five. And there we are. So 4.9, uh, futures shot up big. Uh, they were, when I left for my run, they were up 200 points. And then when I got back, they were still up, but it had come down. Then the market ended up going negative. And then it went real negative, uh, about 250 points, I believe, down. The, talking about the Dow, all the while the NASDAQ staying up on the day. But then the Dow ended up closing down only 30 points. So it kind of had gone up pre-market. It came down. It got down much more, like it kind of V'd down and then uh, back up. So there was a little bit of volatility within the Dow side. The, uh, the NASDAQ closed the day up 1%. The S&P closed up almost half a percent, not quite. Um, but communication services was the big winner on the day. Energy was down 1%. And I, uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the market tomorrow. But um, I do think that there was a little bit more uh, escalation today around bank turmoil. Energy prices had been lower earlier in the day. Oil ended up up on the day, actually um, closing at near $73 a barrel. And then you had a really significant um, rally in bonds again. The, the two-month Treasury bill, the yield dropped 15 basis points. And what's fascinating is that right now, the futures are pricing a 42% chance of a rate cut in July. Now, I don't know if that surfaces or not, but there is a 79% implied probability of a cut by September and a 100% chance in the Fed funds futures of a rate cut by the end of the year. So really you have a strong signal in the markets that's catching itself in the short end of the curve, a strong uh, pricing indicator in the markets that the, uh, there will have to be a mea culpa from the Fed on the last rate cut or two and real quickly. Um, my view is that there should be a mea culpa from the Fed th real quickly and that these last two rate cuts should not have happened. I'm not sure I believe that that will happen that quickly by July, um, but but who knows? There's a lot of catalytic events along the way that could you know necessitate that, including ongoing turmoil in the banking system. 
I think I've covered the basis here of what happened in the market today. Definitely the Fed Funds futures action, which again, a lot of it was in response to the CPI number and just the, the clear indication that the Fed has um, no real foundation by which to say that inflationary concerns are why uh, they feel they need to keep tightening. They could very well go with a pause and stay there. They could also end up cutting. And if so, you could decide if you think that's a good thing or not. If you're borrowing money and they cut rates, you probably think it's a good thing. But if you live in the economy and they're cutting rates because the economy is going in the toilet, that's probably a bad thing. So be careful what you wish for, my borrowing friends. That's uh, more or less all I have today. The Ask David in the DC today, someone asked what it means when we talk about a company beating expectations for earnings or beating expectations or forecast for revenue. And uh, who sets these expectations and why do we care? Where do they come from? And, you know, it's a good point. I don't realize a lot of times that there are certain things I take for granted uh, in terms of financial jargon and financial concepts and financial realities that not everyone is necessarily in tune with. Expectations are, of course, set or, or at least initially set by the companies themselves. They're telling analysts, uh, they're making projections in, in what we call guidance as to what they expect they're going to earn. And then analysts get to go pick it apart and say, well, yeah, but they're assuming they're going to do this with this division. And we think it's going to be worse than that. And, and our analyst, our analysis indicates this could go better. So analysts can start turning the knobs. So expectations really come from the companies and then they get modified by analysts. And some analysts can be right, some can be wrong. You get what's called a consensus estimate, which is sort of the median level from a group of analysts. And that's what we mean by expectation. Uh, we, of course, are dividend growth investors. So I don't care one bit what an analyst says a company's going to do next quarter. Um, I only care what the company itself says they're going to do next quarter to the extent that um, I'm more interested in what they're talking about five quarters down the line or 10 quarters down the line. In other words, are they saying things in, that it has a short-term connotation but a long-term ramification to dividend sustainability. We care about that. So that's the answer, where expectations come from. I hope it's helpful. I hope you've enjoyed listening to DC Today. I hope you enjoyed it so much that you review us, rate us, and uh, subscribe to listen in, in your podcast player of choice. And uh, if you're a video watcher, certainly do give us a little thumbs up there and hit subscribe right on your YouTube. It's so easy. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for reading the DC Today. Mm -hmm.